Hey, I'm Frank J. Avella, the author of the three short plays you're about to experience virtually. Firstly, I want to thank The Tank. A uh, big shout out to Megan, Anthony, and Danielle for the opportunity to present uh, this incarnation three separate times with three different casts to meditate on queer sexual power, past, present, and future. Also, much gratitude to Ashley Garrett for all her support. This project is called Ganymede Revisited and in running order consists of Catamitis, a piece that is set in the present and ripped right from today's headlines. And that piece stars Stephen Walker as Dylan and Vaughn Sherman as Tanner. Uh, followed by Ganymede, where we flash back to ancient Rome. The cast includes David Michael Kirby as Julius Caesar and Cedric Allen Hills as Octavian. The final piece, Gaia, takes place in the future and stars Alice Barrett Mitchell as Barbara and Callie Gilman as Minerva. John David West is providing narration. Right after Gaia, the cast and I will be back to have a brief discussion. Thank you so much for tuning in and please support The Tank and theaters like The Tank, as well as theater artists. And now, Catamitis. I liked girls. You liked getting fucked by me. Not at first, especially, I didn't want to. You were really aggressive. I- Oh, fuck my world some more. Is that why you're here? To cry rape like the rest of them? You come brandishing your own hashtag. You wearing a wire? <laughs> yeah, sure. It's hidden. Come find it. Tanner puts his arms out and spreads his legs. Dylan frisks him. He caresses his upper body at first and becomes a bit rough. He places his hand down Tanner's pants. Tanner lets him. Dylan finds a knife. He pulls it out, opens it, closes it, and puts it back in Tanner's pocket. Your body's changed. I'm an adult now. It's a pity. Paul said you were pretty much a hermit lately. No more parties, no more boy flow, no more career. That one I read about in The Hollywood Reporter. <laughs> it's just one of the legions of the new pariahs created by that misguided movement. <laughs> Time's up your ass! So what's your agenda? I'm not here to add myself to the ever-growing list of accusers, if that's your concern. You need more money? No. I'm doing fine. Yeah. I saw you in My Cousin the Lichen, classy crap. Pays the bills. And let's face it, as you were always fond of telling me, I'm no Daniel Day-Lewis. No, you're not. There's something <laughs> there. Something you can't quite put into words. You fed me that way back when you came to my high school to speak. You were so inspiring. I followed you out of the auditorium to talk about your wizard movies. They meant so much to me. All those heroes were these social misfits, mostly teens, who just didn't fit in. And all the bullies got punished. I asked you if you had a part for me in your upcoming movie. It's bullsy. I was. Only because I saw you couldn't stop staring at me from the podium while you were speaking. You just kept looking over. So I wondered if you saw something special in me. You had that kind of insight at 18. I was 15. And probably not, but in retrospect and after overanalyzing my life to shit, it's the conclusion I've come to. You were not 15. I was just 15. Well, I'm sure I assumed you were 18. You assumed every boy you met and fancied was 18. That's your thing. Don't ask, don't tell, don't give a fuck. Give a fuck. However, you stood out from the rest of those future fast food managers. You were hot as fuck and you were definitely looking back at me. Of course I was. Everyone was. You were the speaker. You were Dylan Lennon. I meant you were looking back at me in that way. Okay, sure. Fine. 
you seemed so interested in what I had to say. So I told you I was starring in Pajama Game at my high school. And I invited you and you actually came. You even came to the after parties afterwards and charmed everyone, told stories, posed for selfies. Afterwards, you pulled me aside and promised me you'd put me in your next movie. It was like being shot up with heroin. Then you put your hand down the back of my pants and kissed me on the mouth. We always. How much did my parents sell me for? I never had the courage to ask. It was a small fortune, and I did give you a part in my film. You gave my naked ass a part. You shot a three minute scene with me in it and just used the shot of my ass getting out of the shower. It was a good ass. <laughs> it's an even better one now. Want to see? Look at you. All tentative. Hmm. Paul said you were abstaining from debauchery because of the lawsuits. No. Paul's a regular chatty cunty Cathy. He's also the only friend besides me who hasn't turned on you. Yet. So, if you're not here to nail me to a cross... Nail you to a cross. You see yourself as some misunderstood Christ-like figure. I'm being sacrificed. A few bad actors didn't make it and they want to blame me. They want to erase my legacy and discredit all the groundbreaking work I've done. They're bent on shredding anything and anyone that doesn't fit into their brave new revisionist world. Maybe they're just trying to create a better world. One where people in power can't get away with being inappropriate with children. I never abused children. You weren't a child. My boys knew what they wanted and what they were doing. You did. But everyone's got to add their verse to the deafening fuck me too chorus. You don't hear me blaming Father Thomas for sucking me off when I was 13 because I enjoyed it. Or, or me moaning about how he victimized, objectified, and sexualized all those other favorite new verbs. Well, he did sexualize. Oh, you are so sneaky. You're trying to excuse what you did by playing victim yourself. Are you even Catholic? Does it matter? You're bent on condemning me. I'm not condemning you. I take responsibility. And I was no better than you when it came to continuing the cycle. The boys you'd bring over, I'd have my way with, too. You learn from the best. Do the best. Being with you was definitely an education. The way you got what, who you wanted, when you wanted it. Like the way you dial a boy. Dial a boy. We'd be watching the CW or some predator pleasing channel and you'd see a boy you wanted and send a text. Within days, that boy would arrive on your doorstep as if by a drone, like a trophy you earned. For what? You did make some great movies, movies that matter and maybe change lives. But you also used and discarded people. Like you were some magnificent god we should all want to open our asses for. Well, there's a cinematic image. I'll have to remember it if I ever work again. Yeah, good luck with that. And sure, I got sucked in. That never-ending flow of boys, actors, singers, writers, street kids, social media stars. You only cared that they were young and fuckable. And if they showed any resistance the way I did, you get them stoned, roofie them, do whatever you had to do. I am my own version of zombie pills now. Lexus something. No, oh, and you'd have Viagra on tap for those more populated nights. Then, get out. Bye. I'm curious, Dylan. What made me so special that you didn't kick me out when you kicked all the others out? What made me so worthy? I loved you. <laughs> Why? 
well, why did you love me besides me being hot as fuck? I never felt like you were using me like the others were for my status, my money, my, my whatever. Like they were, like the dialer boys were. That's fucking ironic because that's exactly what I was doing. I only slept with you because you were Dylan Lennon. And I only stayed with you because I wanted to be cool and rich and a movie star. I sure as shit didn't want to have sex with you. Yes, you did. I know that look. That look? You were my hero. I was confused, definitely, but not only into dudes. You loved it, all of it, especially the role play, the inmate, the guard, fantasies, all of it. Did I? Did I really? Did you ever notice that my cock was usually soft? Don't get me wrong. I liked being your boy until I realized that I was really just my ass. You loved my ass. And there were so many other asses that you wanted to love, but you had me convinced that I was the one. You were. Was I? How can you say that with a straight, excuse the pun, face? I've read the accounts. At least seven others this week were under the impression that you had... Oh, fuck them, those demented faggots. They'll say anything for their 90 seconds of fame. They didn't matter. You were my boy, my hot as fuck boy, and then you left me. Because I got tired of you lending me out to your friends. You'd leave me alone with this mega agent or that studio rep, and what was I supposed to do? So I became a sex whore? That's what you made me. I made you maybe what you wanted, but I didn't know. I never wanted that. Letting creepy old men and creepier young men think it's okay to do whatever they please without taking into account that I'm a human being and might not want to shit blood and cum all week long. And if I said I had no idea what was going on? <gasps> I'd say you should stick to directing because you are no Daniel Day-Lewis either. Well, you could have, you should have said no. Oh, keen advice. Now, I didn't know how to say no. I do now. And thanks to you and your band of predators, I was never able to figure out my sexuality on my own terms. I wonder who I might have been that I never met with you on that day. Maybe married, with kids, maybe happy. Maybe delusional. Are you so sure? Because I'm not. I never got to experience that part of my life. I like women. Growing up, watching Twilight, I wanted to do Edward and Bella. And Jacob. I could have arranged that. Dialer cast. And now, who does it for you now? No one. Uh, I'm seen as this ladies' man with my fans. Shut up. I have fans. And the hot guys on set, they keep hitting on me. But I haven't been with anyone since you. Bullshit. You're 30. There is no way that you've been celibate for three years. You are a dude. I'm 22, but that's about 30 in Dylan years. <laughs> You're a mess. <laughs> Without you. See? There's that look. Tanner kisses him gently, then hard, then gently again. Oh, you're here to fuck with my head. Maybe. Tanner takes out a knife and gets behind him. Dylan tries to move away. Tanner stops him by placing the knife to his throat. Stand still. Yes, sir. You don't like relinquishing power, do you? What power? Touche. 
Is this your revenge fantasy or your rape fantasy? Why can't it be both? Tanner has Nick's Dylan. Oh, I am who I am. I grew up in a time where men who fucked men died. And I'm alive. Not only did we have to deal with the gay stigma that your gen is free of, thanks to us, but we were seen as walking death trapped. Looked at us and your cocks fell off. Who knew that some of us would get lucky? So we all just fucked like crazy because we thought we were going to die soon anyway. There was none of this bothering with love, marriage or kids or any of that nonsense. We did not need or want any of that het bullshit. Today, you're all sexually fluid. Do you even think you could be a happy hetero? Back then, we were fiercely proud to be gay, and I shared that one other pop liberty with the ancient Romans and Greeks. I like my boys young and beautiful, because that's what inspires me, youth and beauty. And you are more beautiful than ever. You look exactly like you did when I first saw you in the third row of that moldy auditorium. Oh, you rock my world. And thinking back on you naked at my side. And here you are, at my side. That look. With that look. Tanner, still holding the knife, advances and kisses Dylan. Dylan steps closer towards the knife and hugs Tanner, still kissing him. Tanner fully embraces him, body and soul, plunging the knife into Dylan, who lets it happen. Dylan slowly falls into Tanner's arms, then to the ground. Tanner puts the knife down and stares at Dylan's body. He then takes out a bottle of pills, opens it and empties it into his mouth. Tanner positions himself on the ground, holding Dylan's lifeless body, caressing him and waiting. Blackout, end of play. Ganymede, July 45 BC. Julius Caesar has defeated the Republican army in the Battle of Munda in Hispania Ulterior, now Spain, for Rome. He remains in Spain for several weeks, conquering towns and imprisoning and slaughtering his enemies. He will soon return to Rome and be made dictator for life, and will shortly thereafter be assassinated by conspiring members of the Senate. But at this moment, his position of power and influence in the known world is unrivaled. During the Spanish campaign, Caesar sends for his great nephew, Octavian who will go on to become Augustus, the first emperor of Rome. Because of ill health, Octavian arrives after the battle is already fought and won. The setting is a tent somewhere in Spain. Caesar stands behind Octavian. After eight relentless hours of blood spilling at Munda, fighting side by side with my men, by the grace of Venus and a prophetic miscalculation on their part, we bested them. Decimated, I was told. Pompey's sons fought well, but they were no match for my legions. No match for you. No match for Rome. You are Rome. I am Rome. <laughs> you crushed them like you vanquished their father at Pharsalus. <laughs> Pharsalus was another matter. Regale me. Again? It's been too long since you've filled me in. You're almost a man now. Almost. We were outnumbered. Two to one. Antony commanded the left, Scylla the right. Domitius center. I anticipated danger to my right flank. Your flank. So I quickly ordered them to form a fourth line. A protection line. I asked my men to summon up their courage. Brave men. And they attacked, wild with enthusiasm. For you. For Rome. You are Rome. Pompey assumed they'd grow tired. <laughs> but they were grew more excited. While their men grew fearful, doubtful. Uh, you remain strong, cocksure. <laughs> cocksure. Uh, the battle was fierce. Savage, sweaty. Oh, that fourth line was our salvation. By Mars. We pounded them into jelly. Pounded, plummeled. And guided them. Uh, great carnage. Oh, victory was ours! Caesar has finished having sex with Octavian. You didn't tell about ordering your men to cut out the soldiers' faces, knowing they would dread visible scars, 
more than fatal wounds. That's my favorite part of this story. Roman vanity revealed. Something I am all too familiar with. Every man fled for fear of being marked. I'd have donned a face mask under my helmet and fought. I'm sure you would have. I apologize for arriving too late to fight. I just sent word you were gravely ill. Mother exaggerates. It's just a fever. Last time I summoned you, you were shipwrecked and fought your way through tough terrain, risking your life to get to me. I can forgive a fever. It pleases me that I please you. You do. Please me. You may not have inherited my height, nephew, but you rival me with those piercing eyes and you are far more exquisite than Helen of Troy could have ever hoped to be. Certainly than I ever was. That's not the rumor, great uncle. <laughs> You'd be wise not to listen to rumor. Even the one about you being a catamite to the king of Bithynia? <laughs> Especially that one. <laughs> You are bold today, nephew. I admire that. But you shouldn't pay heed to Cicero's slanders, attempting to diminish my prestige and portray me as less than masculine. The irony. Irony? In how simple even the cleverest of people are when it comes to deciphering the power dynamics of passivity in the sexual act. We know that can be deceptive. <laughs> Boy. <laughs> Surely you can confide the truth to your nephew, the one who has given himself to you again and again, wild with enthusiasm. Uncle. What I say does not leave this tent. I was slightly older than you, and pleasing the king would yield me certain career benefits, advantages. He was a loving man who helped me forge my path. That's all I wish to share. That's enough, uncle. It is never the act that matters. It's whether you admit to it or not. Rumors will always abound. Truth is never as important as perception. Realize that and you will go far. Do you think I will go far? I do. How far? How far would you like to go? I'm not certain. <laughs> Come now, boy. You have ravenous ambition. I've sensed that in you since you were a child. As a matter of fact, I see in you a great deal of myself at your age. A great compliment. One I'm certain I'm not worthy of. Modesty is a waste of time, nephew. It's not modesty as much as trepidation. I've been force-fed tales of all the omens, prophecies, the serpent that marked mother's body while I danced in her womb foretelling the birth of a Roman king, but what am I really other than a sickly boy? A sickly boy who is growing into a formidable man. Do not let your ailments detract you. I too have my bouts with uh, illness. I've never allowed it to shadow me. But you're the great Caesar. No one would dare. Oh, because I keep certain things hidden. You must do the same. I fear if I do that, I'll disappear into nothingness. Is that true humility? Or are you even more clever than I give you credit for? I know I have certain strengths, but I need a master to guide me. Teach me, uncle. Teach me all I must know to even be half the man you are. You will be much more than that. Take me to Syria so I can fight in the Parthian campaign. I may, boy, but first, you must train and continue your education. You must use your mind and body. I think I can do that. Oh, I know you can. But you must never appear weak. Life's a tricky thing. I felt no joy at Pharsalus when I destroyed Pompey's legions. 
and was devastated when that barbaric Egyptian boy beheaded the man who was once my friend. But I refused to show my pain. Weakness, nephew, is one thing you can never afford to show, not to your friends or your enemies, who may well be disguised as your friends, and never, never to the people. You speak as if I could, in fact, lead one day as you do. Perhaps not as I do, but you can and you will lead. By what right? You've always been an honorary member of the Julian clan. That will only get me so far. <laughs> Careful, nephew. Your ambition is showing and growing. Is it? Your wish was for me to shed my modesty. So it was. Uncle, you have been my mentor, my teacher, my king. I am no one's king. You are Rome's king, therefore you are mine. If the Senate heard you speak this way? Do you see any miserable old goats in this tent? <laughs> Just a virile king and his loyal subject. Oh, get up. Dictator suits me just fine. Is there a difference? In the eyes of both patrician <laughs> and plebeians, there certainly is. <laughs> I have no desire to be king. But if the gods choose you, you have no choice. Are we still speaking about me? You've done well guiding Rome into economic fortune while navigating its self-destructive politics and proven that the Senate isn't necessarily necessary for Rome to thrive and for its working people to bloom. You speak heresy, truthful, perspicacious heresy, but I will not live forever. You're virtually a young man. You show no signs of age. I am 65 today, in fact. Hardly a young man. You are a young man. Are you 16 now? 18. Soon. <laughs> you penetrate like a young man. You lead like a god. You attack like Mars itself. And you speak like a politician and move like a sly panther. <laughs> Beautiful. Terrifying. Does that please you? Do I please you? Octavian, I have great affection for you. You have tackled every task I've given you with intelligence and sagacious tenacity. You listen, you absorb, you debate, you meditate. You leave me breathless. Yes, you please me. Octavian kisses Caesar. And? Yes, uncle. You will be my heir. How is that possible? It is possible because I will decree it so. What of Antony? What of Antony? All of Rome assumes he will be your heir, Antony included. Then all of Rome will be disappointed, Antony included. And the queen of Egypt? Surely does, Rome does not assume Cleopatra to be my heir. No, but your son. Caesarian, she will fight for him. Rome will never accept him as my beneficiary. She's well aware of that. Caesarea says she's an arrogant slide. Cicero should watch his scandalous tongue lest it be cut out and forced down his diabolical throat. There is talk that Caesarian, that he... He is my son. You need only look at his face to see that. And as my heir, you must vow to August that you will look after him. As I would my own brother. Spoken like a true son. A true son. <laughs> I will make you my son. Do you speak the truth? Y you're not jesting with your nephew. I can assure you, by Veritas, I speak the truth and it will be done. I shall have a new will written. It will specify that you are my named heir and that I plan on adopting you. So if anything were to happen to me, my wishes will be known. And I will make sure it is safely hidden. 
uncle. I never expected. Oh, but you dream. We all dream of the unattainable. Nothing is unattainable if you desire it enough. I have dreamed, uncle, dreamed of taking our language, our laws, our art to every corner of the earth to conquer and liberate and enlighten each and every village for Rome, for you, with you. You will be good for Rome. I have always thought that. And the soothsayers may be right, and you may very well rule the world as Alexander once did, son of Apollo. The son of Caesar, uncle. Is it immature that I want to rush back to Rome and shout it all the way from the highest <laughs> temple? <laughs> oh, as much as I would love to see it, that wouldn't be prudent. Octavian, if I were to die prematurely, you were likely to encounter hostility. Some will refuse to accept you, the Senate. I fear Antony and Cleopatra more than those syphilis-ridden patricians. <laughs> <laughs> uh, those two just might come together to destroy you. You need to be prepared, mind and body. You will go to Apollonia, study, learn to be both soldier and scholar. Bring along those two friends, uh, the handsome masculine one and the clever prissy one. Agrippa and Messinus? Oh, I shall. I will make you so proud. You already do. But I need you to be strong and shrewd and ready to fight. And much as I am beloved, I also have many enemies who would love to see me laid out on a funeral pyre. Octavian pricks himself with Caesar's sword. Uncle, I swear by the Furies, by Jupiter, by Caesar, if anything were to happen to you, I would not rest until I have vanquished each and every conspirator and their offspring. Sweet, loyal boy. Caesar licks Octavian's face, then embraces him. Strange. Yours is the only touch that makes me feel human. And you make me feel alive. I can have Silius fill the basin with fresh water so we can bathe. No, I like us filthy, our smells mixing. Oh, sometimes I wish I could consume you. You can try. Please, that will be my offering to you to celebrate the day of our auspicious birth. Have me as many times as you like. Consume me shall and what do i i give you when it's time to commemorate your glorious emergence into our world an empire <laughs> <laughs> octavian's toga falls blackout the end gaia lights up on a completely transparent room containing two very comfortable chairs. In this version of the future, there are microchips implanted in everyone's cerebral cortex and occipital lobe, so viewing all things takes place in one's head. Minerva gets an internal alert. Dispatcher. Barbara enters, wearing a skirt. You sent for me? I did. Why? A complaint was filed. Against me? Well, yes. Why wasn't I just directly informed? You would have been, but there was no precedent for how to handle this. It. I'm not understanding. It's just bizarre. What is? I haven't, in all my years here. <laughs> Five years? Well, yes. That's not all that many years. True, but the innovations, technological and otherwise, the new laws, sweeping changes, what we've accomplished. What we've accomplished? Well, you more than me, of course. Still, this is one for the books. Uh, maybe you can tell me what it is. Yes. Ah, my manners alert. Would you like something to ingest? I'm good. A liquid muffin? Blueberry? Raspberry. Pass. Uzo? Certainly. Uh, now this complaint? Yes. You've been accused of impropriety. Impropriety? Of a sexual nature. <laughs> what? <laughs> Another. 
I know. <laughs> uh, there must be some mistake. Mistakes are no longer made. How can you say that without guffawing? Guffawing. Keep them coming. The trust amendment. <laughs> that nonsense. Uh, may I ask who is making this claim? Hippolina. From the Lime Green Tower? Yes. Do you know another Hippolina? Her report states, first you gave her a look. A look? A look. What kind of look? One of impropriety. Nonsense. I rarely feel the need or urge to look at anyone for longer than three seconds anymore. That's all it takes. And you've been looking at me for much longer than three seconds. You're hard not to look at. Well, thank you. That's very... Wait, now that felt improprietary. That's not a word. Add to word bank, improprietary. It is now. I don't know how comfortable I am with that new policy. It will go through the proper channels before being added. I'm one of those proper channels, so good luck there. And I did not give Hippolina an improprietary look. She sent the surveillance. See? There. Where? There. She said something silly. I rolled my eyes. No, not there. There. That was gas. I had a cup of the new simulated spaghetti bolognese for lunch. The non-dairy gluten-free meat substitute no harm done to any vegetables brand? That's the one. And? All acid, taste-free, intestinal nightmare. Shame. I had high hopes. Oh, but that wasn't the look either. That look. There. See? Oh, that look. Yes, that look. Followed by, and here's why the complaint was filed, that gesture. That gesture? Yes. This gesture? Barbara lifts her skirt at Minerva. Oh, what? Yes, that gesture. This? Yes, that, that. Stop that. I guess I did do that then. But there was no look. A smirk, maybe. Yes, I can see a smirk-esqueness. Are you going to try and make that a word also? Because it isn't, nor should it be. Shall we sit? They sit. Barbara spreads her legs, then closes them. And it's not the first... Pardon? Time. The first time you've done that. This. Yes, that. Stop that. Others have complained? No. But you've pulled more surveillance, haven't you? Yes, I had to. It's procedural. You know that. You can't go around doing what you just did really shamelessly nilly. I can't? You know you can't. You just can't. I mean, there's no reason to, is there? Do we always need a reason to do everything we do? It just, it feels like something that those who shall only be remembered for their destruction would have done, not us. We don't, you can't. Well, you certainly shouldn't. The smirk or the gesture, or this, perhaps. Spreads your legs, closes them. Did you? All of the, the combination, but especially, oh, and that inappropriate side glance at Hippolina's tummy. I saw that. She's fat. We don't think those things, let alone say them. We can think what we like. We fought for that free thought. And I couldn't help glancing the girth on that one. Why would you? I don't understand. I just don't. I, what don't you understand? Why you? You of all women could, would do such a thing. I know your history. You're a heroine, an icon. You were on the front lines during the vagina wars. You and your team realized the way to defeat those who shall only be remembered for their destruction was via their whatses. So once a scrotal septum magnet was invented, we could easily control those who shall only be remembered for their destruction. And last Vagina Freedom Day, you were awarded the fuchsia V for your valor and your fearless prosecution of the very last of the worst of those who shall only be remembered for their destruction. It was even you who suggested that most of those who shall only be remembered for their destruction be banished to Greenland, since nothing of much consequence ever happens there. The others were dispatched to various areas of the world where they mine environmentally friendly ways to continue to combat climate change. And it's working. That was you. So, why? Can you stop pretending that you don't know me, Minerva? It's exhausting and more than a little disconcerting. I'm being professional. For the surveillance, turn it off. We are not really supposed to. But we can, so do it. Fine. But for seven minutes. I can say we took separate orgasm breaks. Separate. Barbara, 
I can't keep covering up for you. This has to stop. For God's sake, we cohabitate. And, and you call me in like I'm some intern? Are you forgetting I created you a job? I am not forgetting that, Barbara. I know that. I owe you. We all owe you. Womankind owes you. Your list of achievements is endless. You championed outlawing social media and replacing it with thought teleportation, which we have near perfected. Removing the hive mind was key to civilization, not just continuing, but flourishing and giving us back free time. Booming and blooming. That was the mantra. And you fought for education for all, a diverse, soci socially conscious, class encompassing education told from the female perspective, directly injected into the bloodstream. Deciding, curricul uh, deciding curriculum is still one of our greatest challenges. One that we are meeting head on, thanks to the committees you put together. You argued against genocide when most of us wanted to eliminate those who shall only be remembered for their destruction. And you were right. We certainly haven't figured out how to procreate without their deposits. <laughs> we even spearheaded that program where those who choose to can spend an evening with one of those who shall only be remembered for their destruction, for their own carnal needs and or desires. Uh, can't we just say men, just for these seven minutes? You can. I refuse. And we have less than five minutes left. That's because you talk so much! So precise. Someone must be. You even allowed those with a queer bend to survive and thrive in Australia. <laughs> that continent needed some pizzazz. I have virtual visits with my three gays every other day. I'd be lost without them, especially during award season. <laughs> to watch them constantly engaging in sexual misconduct, which none of them seem to mind, it's a hoot and a half. If you say so. They represent no real threat to us. You prove that in your seminal Save the Gays proclamation. Someone had to. And you introduced the highly controversial bill to slowly allow select and rehabilitated handfuls of those who shall only be remembered for their destruction back into society. Strictly probational. I'm iffy on it. But you've been right about most everything else. Thanks to you and our sister pioneers, we can work and have children with no fuss. Quote, why should women accept this picture of a half-life instead of a share in the whole of human destiny? Betty would be proud. Oh, that bitch. Barbara. Thanks to you and those like you, we don't have to dress our faces or our bodies to impress anyone but ourselves. And we are no longer sexualized. Well, we're not supposed to be anyway. But this thing you keep doing, it's reminiscent of a certain comic from the time we no longer speak about. He was funny. I believe the tribunal exiled him to the Arctic Circle or he's still doing live shows. Would you like to see? No. Oh. We negotiate, compromise, and problem solve in creative and innovative ways now, and our planet is so much better for it. Even our world and religious leaders have learned to act for the greater good. We are a kinder, safer, more thoughtful, more inclusive civilization. We do quite a bit of bickering, but we also get things done. Bravo us! Why are you still speechifying, Minerva? It's like you're on a pulpit pausing for applause. Dear goddess, you have the shadow surveillance still on, don't you? You're trying to impress the council. I can't in good conscience turn everything off. And the council is already impressed by me. You can and you will turn it off. All of it now. Fine. They kiss. Minerva grabs Barbara under her skirt. <gasps> Minerva? I would say that was downright improprietary. I would say you enjoyed it. I wouldn't contradict that. But we can't do this here. Because? Because we do this at our domicile each evening. At 8 p.m. sharp, followed by food consumption, a dispenser of imported wine, two hours of a council-approved film, then slumber. There is far too much order in our world now. The interconnectedness is great, but we've lost intimacy and creativity along the way. Is that why you're going about flashing your vagina at every Sam, Sue, and Sally? Sam for Samantha, of course. Of course. I don't know why I do it. Maybe because it gives the flashy something to smile about, or they're either shocked or aroused, but it seems to give them pleasure, which gives me pleasure. No one else reported me, and I flashed a meter six times. I've even received compliments and two propositions. Only that lard-ass Hippolina. Barbara. <laughs> but you don't like her either. But not because of her overweightiness. That one, no. Fine. She does have that mole. Yeah, ugh. Right under her left nostril. Makes her nose look like it's in distress. Oh, this is terrible. We shouldn't. But what? Have some fun? Not at the expense of others. We are from different generations. We share a desire to make this world a better place. That we do. 
And let's not forget who pursued whom. You were the smartest, sexiest woman I ever encountered. You still are. Flatterer. I did and do love how you wanted to take up the torch, up the ante, and fix the world. You also loved how I looked like a young one of them with my cropped <laughs> hair. You miss them? Him? My husband? No, not at all. What I miss is spontaneity. I can be spontaneous. I just like to plan it. Let me choose tonight's feature. Fine. But does it have to be one of theirs? No. The films we're making now are just as good as theirs. But it would be nice to revisit the 70s sometime. I concede. For tonight. I, I must turn back on now. We've exceeded seven minutes. What do I tell the council? Tell them to advise Hippolyta to get that thing lanced. Tell them the truth. I have nothing to hide. Fine. I might leave some of it out of my report. I will see you at home. Oh, and please synchronize your calendar for tomorrow's virtual voting. What's tomorrow? I didn't get an alert. We're discussing an edict that would abort male fetuses? Just the ones who show a genetic predisposition towards violence or sexual inappropriateness. Uh, and how did this nonsense make it to forum? Many of us are wary about the future. You think this is a valid bill? I think it has merit and should be debated. I disagree, and we must all agree. Excise it. Fine. But it will be introduced again in the future. Not while I'm around. Barbara begins to leave, then looks back at Minerva, who flashes her. End of play. Hey guys, welcome back. Um, thank you so much uh, for tuning in. We're really grateful. And um, right now I would like to introduce my cast in no particular order, but they will wave. Uh, Stephen Walker, who played Dylan, uh, Yvonne Sherman, who played Tanner, David Michael Kirby, who was Julius Caesar, Cedric Allen Hills, who played Octavian, Alice Barrett Mitchell, who played Barbara, and Callie Gilman, who was Minerva. Um, I also want to introduce uh, John David West, who provided narration and uh, amazing Technical help, thank you, JD. And uh, Ashley Garrett, who is uh, one of our supporters, benefactors, friends, uh, confidants, uh, somebody who we just adore. Hi, Ashley. Hi. And I'm Frank J. Vella, back again, uh, the author. Um, I'm just gonna <laughs> start the discussion portion, and I, I wondered how I really wanted to do this, and I thought I would tell a little story without mentioning any names. Uh, when I was a freshman in college, uh, I met one of my mentors, uh, an artist that I hero worshipped, and still do actually, and I had done a term paper on his work, and I sent it to him, um, and much to my astonishment, he actually called me. And over the next few months, I would have drinks with him, dinners, he even took me to a Broadway show. Uh, yeah, I was really young, uh, and after that particularly magical night where we went to a Broadway show, and then he had his cook like make this special lobster without onion or garlic because I'm allergic. Uh, we went back to his apartment um, and suffice to say, I wasn't expecting or prepared for what happened next. Uh, I spent decades thinking I shouldn't have been so naive and I should somehow be feeling happy because he chose me. Um, but recently I've kind of revisited this part of my past and can now acknowledge that uh, he seduced a boy who was confused and definitely did not want what happened to happen. Kind of as Tanner says in Catamitis, uh, I didn't know how to say no. Um, and uh, I never shared that story, actually, certainly not publicly. Um, so I just wanted to uh, put that out there as a way of opening up this conversation. Thank you. You, you're a, you're, you're a member of the Me Too community, Frank. <laughs> I never thought of it that way, actually. Um, but yeah, I, I guess, I guess so. Uh, I'm curious if uh, anybody has any similar thing to share or uh, from somebody that they know. Um, 
Well, I, th I think what was so powerful for me about the Me Too movement when it began was how it was, I didn't know anybody who was not a victim to some degree or another. And, and one of the conversations that I think you mentioned, you deal with a lot in your various and sundry pieces, it's dealt with in the piece with the actor and the intern in particular, um, or how, whatever he is to him. Um, and it's certainly in consent, um, but this, the spectrum of abuses, uh, and, and it's a conversation that we haven't had as a culture where we had an opportunity to have it during the Al Franken debacle, but there's a difference between what Al Franken was accused of and what Roy Moore or Donald Trump is accused of. And there, and any woman can tell you that there's a difference between somebody patting you on the bum or somebody saying something inappropriate or make, even making you feel uncomfortable by what they say to you in the workplace and a physical assault or, you know, there is a spectrum. And that's a conversation that we as a culture have not yet had and it's an important important conversation and and to piggyback on that i think um part of what some of these are trying to also do is discuss some things beyond um so much has been said about women in, in the workplace and you know specifically in the entertainment industry who have been um abused uh been sexually inappropriate with but we still seem to avoid when it happens to men when it happens to young men. Right. I think we're getting there though. I mean, I think we've gone from starting from, you know, me too, I was raped to then, you know, looking through the spectrum of harassment, you know, just being uncomfortable, you know, like Alice was saying, there is this, this spectrum that we're, I think, starting to acknowledge. And I think that men will come into this a little bit later. Um, I think there's a stigma around men admitting that they're a, a victim at all in, in most things. So, you know, I think once as a culture, we're a little bit more um, maybe softened or more compassionate to every individual's experience, then more people will feel comfortable just being a part of the whole you know, and, and being able to admit um, their victimhood, you know. Yeah. It's scary, you know, Frank, you, you just, you said that you just shared that for the first time and that was how many years ago? And, and you're not like a- And you're not very young. <laughs> <laughs> you're not a timid person. And no. you certainly don't, you're, no one is shaming you into like being, you know, stay a strong man and, and all that. But of course, even you had trouble sharing that. I had trouble believing it, believing it was what I guess it was. See, I'm still saying words like I guess. Mm -hmm. I know right. it, it's hard to um, accuse someone with conviction because it's just you. I mean, I spoke about um, this um, when I first got involved in the project. I think I was groomed by my female teacher from 12 to 16, but I never felt like I was being groomed because I was a boy and therefore it was meant to be cool. And, I, and, and she was beautiful. And it's another thing, um, predators don't have to look scary. Um, generally, they're not. And that's what confuses you. They're attractive, talented, or, or, I don't, or someone in power over you. So. Yeah, it is tricky and it can be done by a man or woman to anyone. I just think it's the only reason I know it was abuse or along the lines is because I was so young. Mm -hmm. And as an adult, I can go, we can, we can basically all draw a line. If you're under 16, whatever it is, then clearly it's abuse. But it gets blurred as you get older. Not necessarily, you know, we, don't, we don't mature. <laughs> at different levels, you, the same thing could have happened to me at 22. I was no more wiser. Um, but that's just my two pennies worth involving that, you know, yeah, it, guys should be allowed to talk and not feel embarrassed about it. But it is embarrassing, you know, it is. It's like boys were patting me on the back. Well done, you know, Miss Marsh, the sexy jazz teacher, you know, but I was too young and it was, you know, not appropriate. Right. And you're right about how it can happen in any age. And um, 
also at any level of power. And that's something that also isn't discussed enough. I think we think of it as happening, oh, you know, the, the head of Paramount Pictures and, you know, the head of CBS. But the truth is, I, and I'm not, I won't mention any names, but I know of an artistic director of a particular theater company who's been sexually harassing, uh, uh, using her position um, to get what she wants. Uh, and she's been doing it for years and she continues to get away with it. Mm. Yeah. Well, there's, um, there's also the complications of um, playing with people's emotions and how that, where it's not, it is not just sexual in nature, it is emotional in nature and making, um, it is an abuse of, it is an abuse of a, of a person's emotions, figuring out what the victim wants and appeasing to that, um, feeding that, um, cause I think, you know, especially, um, in act one of this play, we're looking at someone who has gotten a lot of um, what they want um, and, has, and has benefited from this. So in that way, the relationship becomes, um, the relationship between this director and, um, and, this, and this kid who's now grown up is, um, is very, um, it's complex in that um, though in that those things are um are a benefit of what of what happens uh and um and it's um and that's like and that is scary because it plays with the person's emotions of i wanted this and i and um and it uh blurs it blurs like the person's perception of what it means for them to, of like, of wanting uh, and what, what it means to want um, what happened or not want it. Um, Very true. You're saying you're almost thinking that the abuse is almost a currency. <laughs> like is, a, um, is a what? That the abuse is almost a currency. It's a payoff. Yes, it caused me damage, but I got this. So that's where it's, especially when you're, Yes, um, and especially people in such early development who are figuring out what it is they want in life. There's like so much they don't know yet. And then somebody takes advantage of that. They're like, I, I, like, I see you're ambitious and you want these things. I think Octavian is also very, a very ambitious human being. And because of that, they're like, you're looking at these youthful and ambitious human beings who could they they want something but they're not entirely sure how to get it they're not sure what it entails to get what they want um how they can make an impact in this world as a young person um and then you along comes somebody who has that apparently who has the key to what to what they want um and it's it's very it, it's a lot to be somebody who is who is like trying to figure all that out and then somebody else who has already gotten that figured out um well that's the trouble yeah. too is that adults know how to manipulate and adults yeah. do know that adults know what they're doing yeah when you look at someone who is a child or someone with less experience um you know that is an easier person to manipulate and I think I can uh, quote another of Frank's plays, um, ambition does not denote consent. Mm -hmm. And what, you know, it's funny, what's interesting about that as well is, um, I, I think that we always think of it in terms of age, yet I could tell you that I was 18 going on 19 when this happened to me, and I was naive as shit. Yeah. yeah, two years later, I was, you know, kind of savvy to all kinds of, but I, you know, I didn't know anything and, you know, just kind of allowed this person to, you know, be my guide. And that predator knew that. See, and what's funny, you say that word and I'm like, I immediately want to say, no, he's not, he's a genius. But I guess one thing doesn't take away from the other. It can be both those things, which is harsh. 
reality. Yeah. <laughs> they can be great geniuses who are also predators. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and that's part of this, you know, that's part of the, the conversation to have, you know, is to have the conversation and to try to discuss the nuances, I think, because we live in, we live in tweet time where it's so easy to distill everything to um, this is bad, this is good, this person's bad, this person's good. And that's never been the case and we should never allow it to be that, but I'm done speechifying. <laughs> Uh, let me ask you guys if anybody um, had anything they wanted to share about any of this, the pieces specifically. Not to put anybody on the spot. They're all pretty intense. Thank you. Great writing. Thank you. Great acting. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. Let me start over. They're all, <laughs> they're all pretty intense. Great writing and acting and directing. Aren't you directing? Yeah, I have been with a little help from the man in the corner who may not be in the corner, JD. Yeah, JD. Yeah. It's amazing too to watch it happen on Zoom because around, on, on, when you're not together, it's impressive how the actors can still, it seems like you are together. Yeah. Yeah, that's, it's been a, that's kind of a surprise that we've discovered like in the past four weeks of working in this weird medium of Zoom acting and, and uh, presenting. It's like there's these conventions that seem to work. Like you, you, you buy into it that they're really talking to each other. Right. Or passing, you know, a, a glass yep. across the screen and picking it up. It's, it's kind of, who knew, you know? It's kind yep. of a nice surprise to discover these little tricks while we're stuck at home. Well, I, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I'm done. Oh. Um, well, I'm going to wrap us up with one uh, little question um, that I'm going to throw at everyone. Uh, I, it's a year from now, and um, uh, this, uh, the apocalypse, the Black Death, whatever you want to call this, the pandemic is over, and uh, you're on stage performing. What play are you performing in? <laughs> and I will start with Callie. I will actually be on stage uh, in Dublin um, revisiting Lourdes. Yes. Yeah, you will, won't you? Yes, that's right, God willing. Right. Again, yeah. Alice? Well, uh, either Vatican Falls or Consent. <laughs> Vaughn? Oh my, I, anything I could get in, anything. in front of someone. If oh, that's your answer. <laughs> theater to, to be a part of it. <laughs> okay, hear that, guys? Vaughn's ready for anything. Take uh, it to me. Cedric. Um, I, I'm, yeah, I'm on that boat, too. I will take what what is there. Uh, I also want to write my own pieces i have already i've gotten stuff produced into festivals but i like i want to write my own pieces i want to get my own work out there um perhaps performing them as well um and uh yeah some co a combination of mediums with like music visuals um and um some and uh movement um that I want to do uh, that will tell a story. Nice. Yeah. Michael, David, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, if I'm acting, it's probably something with new ambassadors related to their uh, Blurring Boundaries uh, Festival, which usually happens around June. Um, but then again, I might have written something for it. I have multiple writing projects that I'm doing right now. I could also be directing for that. So um, who knows? But I just hope we're actually in a an actual space and not a virtual one. Yeah, amen to that. And Mr. Walker. Well, Vaughn, you're coming to Peace Town, aren't you? We're putting this play on. <laughs> oh yeah, we're gonna we're yeah. gonna go put this up in Provincetown. <laughs> I'm, saying, I'm here in Provincetown, and it's still artistic community, and um, there are so much, I haven't spent much time here, and there is so much space here. You could do it. We've got beaches and everything, so we can have open air theatre. Um, it definitely can work. Um, yeah, I'm going to hopefully use a lot of my past and um, directorial, well, choreography and um, talents and maybe bring it to the acting side. Good. You have my blessing. That sounds great. 
JD, what are you doing? I'm getting a haircut. <laughs> this is crazy. Um, I, do, I would love to do more film, actually. Uh, I, I, I really enjoy that, and I want to make some more movies. Um, and, um, but definitely theater and uh, a nice comedy would be fun. And Ashley, what do you be up to? I'm, I'm going to be in Ireland. That's right. <laughs> You're going to be coming with us to Lourdes, God, yeah. like said, God willing. Um, well, guys, I thank you so much um, for taking part in this. And um, uh, everybody stick around, but I'm going to end everything now. I want to thank The Tank again, everyone at The Tank. Um, thank everybody for tuning in. Everybody support your small theaters, support your fellow, uh, your artists. I said fellow artists. Well, your fellow artists as well. And uh, let's just try to be kind to one another and practice a little empathy. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.